Have you or a patient of yours ever had a bout of diarrhea that you could not easily explain? In patients with possible exposure and risk, veterinarians and physicians should consider looking for evidence of intestinal parasites of the cryptosporidium genus that cause cryptosporidiosis. We'll call it crypto from now on. For veterinarians and farmers, cryptosporidiosis is a parasitosis that is recognized worldwide associated with diarrhea in neonatal calves, lambs, kids, foals, piglets, and it can affect humans as well. The parasite combines its effects with intestinal viral and bacterial pathogens leading to intestinal injury and diarrhea. Although there are 19 species of cryptosporidium, C. hominis is the most common cause of diarrhea in humans, with a smaller percentage associated with C. parvum. C. parvum is zoonotic, that is, infective to people, as well as a variety of animal species. Zoonotic human infections, particularly by C. hominis and C. parvum, from domestic animals, may be a reservoir for infection, with the young, pregnant, and immunosuppressed people being most susceptible. Why is crypto so difficult to prevent and manage? The parasite has a tough outer shell that allows it to survive for a long time in the environment as sporulated oocysts. It can survive for days even in properly chlorinated swimming pools. Spread by swallowing of fecally contaminated water, crypto is one of the most common causes of recreational water illness in the United States. Swallowing even a small amount of water from a pool or contaminated waterway can convey the parasite, leading to one to two weeks of diarrhea. Surface or drinking water contaminated by infected animals or feces is the root cause. For example, feces from infected babies can contaminate a swimming pool or wading pool, and infected calves can place animal handlers at a high risk for the disease. Concurrent infections with an intestinal virus like rotavirus or coronavirus generally causes more severe diarrhea. Immunocompromised animals and humans are more susceptible to clinical disease. However, prior exposure to another cryptosporidium species, even non-pathogenic ones, has been shown to provide protection to a pathogenic species. Immune protection is associated with cell-mediated and humoral as well as intestinal antibodies. Generally, cryptosporidiosis is not a fatal disease unless it is complicated by other infectious, nutritional, or environmental factors. The parasite targets small intestinal cells attaching to and being enveloped by the apical portion of the enterocyte. They reside within a unique intracytoplasmic yet extracellular space, essentially a vacuole, allowing them to siphon nutrients from the cytosol. Comparing infected tissue from a mouse on the left to uninfected tissue on the right, histopathology shows characteristic loss of enterocytes, shorter villi, and crypt hyperplasia with a mixed inflammatory cell infiltrate. So it shouldn't be hard to imagine that the functional result is a diarrhea with a secretory component caused by enhanced chloride secretion due to the stimulus of enteric nerves and enhanced permeability of the blood mucosal barrier and a malabsorptive component caused by net loss of enterocytes and villi. It's important to understand a bit about the life cycle of cryptosporidium, which can be broken into six stages. Ingestion of the oocyst leading to existation or release of infective sporozytes, then sexual multiplication, then gamete formation, and then fertilization, followed by oocyst wall formation, and then finally infective sporozyte formation and passage in the feces. Generally, infection, usually in the lower part of the small intestine, persists until the host immune response eliminates the parasite. The prepatent period, that is the time between infection and excretion of the oocyst, can be up to a week, with oocyst excretion occurring for one to two weeks. Heavy environmental contamination with oocysts leading to contamination of feed, water, and farm equipment, or other fomites, may occur. Focusing on crypto and animal species, C. parvum is the most common species causing calf diarrhea and cryptosporidial oocysts have been detected in the feces of 70% of one to three week old dairy calves, 
most often causing diarrhea in the first two weeks. In young lambs and goats, C. parvum may also cause diarrhea and high fatality in one to three week old lambs and goat kids. In pigs, cryptosporidiosis can be seen between one week old through market age, but its most common manifestation is a malabsorptive diarrhea post weaning. Most studies indicate that cryptosporidiosis is not a common disease in foals, and infection in immunocompetent foals are usually subclinical. How do animals with cryptosporidiosis present clinically? Calves generally have a mild to moderate diarrhea that persists for several days. Compared to other causes of calf diarrhea like rotavirus, coronavirus, or E. coli, the age of onset is later, and the duration of diarrhea tends to be a few days longer. Feces are often pale, watery, and contain mucus. In most cases, the diarrhea is self-limiting after several days, but animals can become lethargic, anorectic, and dehydrated, albeit more mildly than other causes of calf diarrhea. Fatality can occur when attention to caloric needs are not met through proper milk replacement. So how does a clinician diagnose this parasite? Essentially, oocysts must be identified in fecal smears or by flotation techniques. However, you should be aware that the oocysts are small, only 5 to 6 micrometers in diameter, and they're non-refractile. That means that phase contrast microscopy and not normal light microscopy is generally necessary to see them. While sophisticated antibody-based and PCR techniques exist, sheathers flotation, sedimentation, staining is the most sensitive, specific, and cost-effective of these techniques. Basically involves centrifugation of a fecal sample suspended in sheather solution, aspirating the top layer and diluting the fluid in saline, then recentrifugation and examination for sediment of uh, oocysts. Perhaps by now you figured out that this is a difficult disease to control, but that the keys to control are in understanding the life cycle and transmission of the parasite. Strategies for reducing its prevalence on a farm include the following. One, animals should be birthed in a clean environment. Two, as the immunity is crucial, ample amounts of colostrum should be fed at an early age. It has been determined that the presence of cryptosporidium specific antibodies in the gut is what provides passive immunity. So far, the development of a specific vaccines has not been successful, probably because of the complex life cycle and difficulty in generating high titers of antibody in the gut lumen. Three, Newborns should be kept separate without contact with others for at least the first two weeks of life, and attention to food and water hygiene is critical. 4. Attention to reduction of environmental and fomite transmission is crucial. Diarrheic animals should be isolated from healthy ones, including for several days after recovery. 5. Housing should be completely disinfected between uses. What makes control even more difficult is that oocysts can survive for several months in a cool and moist environment and are resistant to most standard disinfectants. Ammonium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, and formal saline can destroy oocyst infectivity. Fecal oocyst infectivity is also reduced after several days of drying. And six, rodents and pets should be prevented from having access to feed storage areas. And how about prevention of animals to human zoonotic transmission? Immunocompromised people should be restricted from access to young animals and possibly from access to farms. How can you treat an infected animal? Let's start with the fact that currently there are no approved drugs available in the United States for active cryptosporidium infection in food animals. One unapproved drug, halofuginone, must actually be used as a prophylactic to benefit calves. Anecdotal reports of success with extra-label use of various drugs have generally not been validated for safety and efficacy through controlled trials. As such, evaluation of treatment strategies remains a fertile ground for research. So the farmer and veterinarian are left with supporting affected animals with fluids and electrolytes, both orally and parenterally. Whole milk should be given in small quantities several times daily to optimize digestion and minimize weight loss. As for treating human patients, Nitazanoxide is the only FDA-approved drug for the treatment of cryptosporidium, but it is only partially effective in immunocompetent patients. It's therefore not effective in the group of patients most needing help, such as the neonate, or those immunosuppressed by drugs or disease, such as HIV-AIDS. In summary, 
Cryptosporidiosis is a zoonotic parasitic disease that causes diarrhea, generally in the young and immunocompromised patient. Managing its prevalence depends upon good hygiene based upon a clear understanding of its life cycle and its transmission.